So I'm going to start with a little bit about me, but the, the reason I want to share a little bit about me is not about me, but to help you understand where my passion for this topic comes from. So um, connecting it back a little bit to the presentations before, so I would say that Ritu before and I are a perfect complement because Ritu has been in school since she was three and has never had a real job. I left MIT 30 years ago and wandered in the wilderness of uh, corporate America before I came back. So I am an MIT boomerang, did my undergrad at Imperial College London, master's and PhD at MIT. But over that time, I went through pharmaceuticals and consumer products and got to do a whole lot of stuff that I think is really fun and the kind of stuff that I think when done well, really energizes technical folks. And so for the last eight years um, that I was in industry, I was the innovation lead for all the things that the Clorox company owns that nobody knows the Clorox company owns. So you look at that and you go, yes, the Clorox company does own Hidden Valley Ranch. They don't put that on the bottle for obvious reasons. But what's interesting is, as you look at that portfolio of products, it kind of gives you a little bit of an insight into the issues that we face when we think about corporate innovation. Because inherent in that set of products are brands that go all the way from very, very connected to the consumer to brands that are not at all connected to the consumer. So just you guys can just shout out, if you think, which of those brands do you think is the one that has the strongest connection to consumers? You think Frestep, interesting. Other, other thoughts? Burt's Bees, absolutely. So Frestep is actually very, has very strong emotional connection, but the, spe the piece of the population that's actually cat owners is smaller. On the other hand, what I can tell you is when I was at Clorox, I had all of these brands on the back of my computer, and I would sit in an airport, and without fail, someone would, apropos of nothing, come to me and say, oh, wow, Burt's Bees, that's really cool. And so really strong emotional connection. On the other hand, which is the one that you think has the least emotional connection? It, that might have been true two years ago. <laughs> it isn't true now. And actually, the one that has the least emotional connection is glad, because nobody has an emotional connection with their trash bags. And when they do have an emotional connection, it's negative. <laughs> and so what I wanted to do to take you through this is to help you to understand my passion for helping technical folks, scientists and engineers, do corporate innovation comes from spending a career doing corporate innovation myself and understanding myself and watching the frustration that technical folks sometimes have in being able to engage fully and successfully in the innovation process. However, when they do, it's also amazing to look at the reaction. And when a team, including technical folks, is able to achieve something that few, including them, believed was possible, that feeling is incredible and it's addictive and what they want to do is they want to do it over and over again. So if you can unlock this, what you start is a virtuous cycle in your companies that is going to do amazing things. So this is funny, right? This is an R&D conference and I'm going to talk on corporate innovation without mentioning technology. Well, I'll mention a little at the end, but the focus is certainly not on technology. So when Michael Sima talked this morning, he talked about innovation and he talked about invention. But Michael didn't separate those two. And it's easy to believe that invention and innovation are the same thing, but they're not. Because invention is just about creating something new, something new to the world, something nifty, whiz bang, that's really cool. Innovation only happens when we can figure out how to extract value from that invention. And it's that core that 
connecting with value that provides value to consumers, value to those who are creating it, and value to the companies that they work for. That is the intersection. So what is needed? So it's the ability to work across disciplines and across functions and to connect the dots in ways that create value. And it's the ability to lead and work collaboratively in challenging complex situations to push through when things get tough and to deliver breakthrough results. How many of you are technically trained in some way? A whole lot of you. For how many of you was any of this core to the curricular in your technical training? Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know of any. And so think about the technical folks in your companies. How are they going to learn this? And granted, they're smart. We were all smart. We all figured it out eventually. But what would have happened if we had figured it out earlier? If it was easier for them, what difference would that make to how quickly they became effective in your companies and how effective your companies were as a result? So this is my sh short but not exhaustive list of what delivers great corporate innovation. It's the capability to envision and deliver solutions to problems and needs large and small, through a whole host of things. It's the personal creative application of scientific and engineering principles. It's a deep understanding of and rapport with stakeholder needs. It is the character, the integrity, the leadership by example to motivate and inspire individually and to inspire teams. It's the ability to apply and guide technical design to implement a product or a process. Michael talked about innovation, not just in product, but in process earlier today. And it's the will, the courage, and the technical skill to be responsible for the success of the team or the program. And then it's the ability to force and drive to actually deliver. To deliver on spec, on time, within budget, with a commitment to excellence in everything that you do. So it's not enough to be technically smart. It takes more than that. And so what it takes is the ability to go from what happens when many young people come to schools like MIT, where they are smart, they are fiercely driven, and they have been in charge of their own success. And somewhere in the world when they leave MIT, they're going to realize that nobody comes to MIT because it's easy. And they come to MIT because they want to solve the world's most challenging and complex problems. A lot of those are going to be solved in the companies that you work for. But those problems were never solved alone. And so how do we help students make that transition from individual to good follower and leader and how do you help those in your company make that transition from coming in to really being an effective part of your corporate innovation teams? So the technical leadership programs at MIT, there are four of them. There is the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, UPOP, which is for sophomores. There is the Gordon Engineering Leadership Program, GEL, which is for juniors and seniors. There is the Graduate Engineering uh, Leadership Program, which is both for master's and PhD students. And there is the School of Engineering Communication Lab, which runs across both the undergrad and the graduate space. I'm going to use GEL just as an example of the kind of work that we do, just to give you a little bit of an insight. And just so that you're you know, taking the guideline here, what I'm going to do at the end of this is to help you understand how you might use some of the things that we teach our students to help you as you look at corporate innovation. So GEL was initiated in 2007 with a $20 million startup gift from Bernie Gordon. Uh, if you look up Bernie Gordon in Wikipedia, it'll tell you he is the father of modern day analog to digital conversion, so a little bit of a big deal. He's 94 years old. He's every bit as smart and as ornery as you can possibly imagine. But Bernie has an interesting love-hate relationship with MIT. 
because Bernie's from Massachusetts. He was from Western Mass. He applied to MIT uh, just before World War II. And in those days, if you were anywhere close to MIT, you actually had to come to MIT for an interview. And in the interview with a professor, uh, the professor asked him what he'd been doing over the summer. And he said, well, I come from a farm, and one of the issues on a farm is that there's no easy way for the workers in the field to go to the bathroom. So I've been engineering a better outhouse. And they had the rest of the interview. And at the end of the interview, the professor said, that was very interesting, but I don't think that you're what MIT is looking for. And MIT turned Bernie Gordon down. <laughs> now, World War II happened. Bernie went to war, came back to MIT as part of the GI Bill. The postscript to the story is years after, when Bernie became the very first MIT alum to win the National Medal of Engineering, the professor who had turned him down was in the audience as Bernie received it and said to him, I think I might have made a mistake. <laughs> so what drives Bernie's belief is that he believes that in the period after World War II, where Vannevar Bush from MIT pushed an entire new world of science in engineering, the amount of technical change that started to happen and the amount of technology that started to come into our engineering curricular basically crowded everything else out. And there, make no mistake, engineering curricula getting deep techn technologically was a good thing, but there were unintended consequences. And the unintended consequences, it, one of them was that engineering, which had started off as a very applied discipline, increasingly became more and more theoretical. And so what Bernie did is he endowed this program as a co-curricular program to wrap around MIT students' education the things that he thought that they would need in addition to their technical education. So what it does is that it develops character, leadership, communication, and teamwork skills. It has its own curriculum. It's represented across all of the engineering departments and the student population. What's interesting, given the talk that Ritu just did, is that GEL is currently 65% female. So what's interesting is that understanding and developing these leadership skills it seems that women understand that they will benefit disproportionately from them because they are at a disadvantage and they are self-selecting into the program. So it's, it's an interesting, because MIT right now in the School of Engineering is just over 50% female. But there's an interesting thing going on there. We've grown from the start where we had 21 students to about 185 students a year, which is about 20% of the engineering school. Um, and we have many of your companies uh, in sponsorship, in participation in our engineering leadership labs and on our advisory board. You know, Scott Northrop Grumman, thank you very much. Uh, Scott was kidding me that I shouldn't make this talk because we are one of MIT's best kept secrets and now the secret's gonna be out. But we are happy to engage. And, and the positive benefit of that is that it gets your companies in front of students as well which means that you create this virtuous cycle as our graduates get into those companies, the companies see the value of the graduates and we, we have a wonderful thing going. Uh, we have expanded to include a professional education course and a graduate engineering leadership program because we heard loud and clear that if undergrads need this, well, graduate students might need it even more and being one of them, I represent that remark, so yes. <laughs> So our mission is to educate and develop outstanding MIT students as potential future leaders in the world of engineering practice and development, and to endeavor to transform engineering leadership in the nation, thereby significantly increasing its product development capability. And so the bottom line in terms of our, is that we believe that we develop students who are better equipped to be effective in driving and eventually leading corporate innovation in your companies. So this always comes to the question of, well, can you teach leadership? And the answer in my mind is yes, but. You can't teach it, but it can be developed. So simple example, how many of you can ride a bike? How many of you can ski? If you didn't know how to ski, 
and someone sat you down and explained to you how to ski, do you think you could actually get on a slope and actually enjoy skiing? I look back to the time and I was a snowplow and it was uncomfortable and it took a while before you got your feet. So what we've found in gel is that we can develop it. And what's interesting is that there are two very distinct populations and I think you will probably see this in your companies as well. There are those who already see themselves as aspiring leaders and as they come in and as they do the experiential exercises, what they realize is that they're not quite as good as they thought they would be. And they learn. And then we have a whole big section of people who don't see themselves as leaders, but tentatively like toe into it going, you know, I probably have to do this, so I will. <laughs> not always, surprisingly, not always. Um, but what they do, is that they find out that in a safe space, they're actually much better at it than they thought they, they would be, and they also learn. But, sorry, so some of them are women, but also we had a, a team where one of the women was definitely the alpha at the table, and after a couple of weeks of this, her team sort of like, okay, What's going on? And what she said is, look, uh, I'm an MIT junior, but I'm 17 years old. <laughs> and through all of my life, I have had to be the loud one just to stake my claim at the table. And for her team to go, it's OK. You have a seat at this table. And to see the, 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 that moment for her was transformative. Um, and, and so it, it, it doesn't cut as cleanly, but there's definitely some of that going on. But what we do, and you'll see, is that we truly believe that leadership is a contact sport, and that by going through a process that involves, we start with a framework, we start with the models and the theory that underpin uh, leadership, and then what we have is this circle of application and practice. So all of our GEL students between the junior year and the senior year have to do an internship plus, which means in addition to their internship, they have to approach whoever they're doing their internship with and say, I'm involved in a leadership program and these are the things that I'm working on and I want a project that both helps me with that and gives me feedback on it. For companies that choose to invest, there's one even above that that we actually have that's called an impact ship, where the company and Gel work together to actually define the projects. And that is sort of like, it's going back to the old days of co-op projects, but in a, in a summer setting. And it's amazing. We've had now two summers of it. Every student who has taken an impact ship has been offered a job every job offer has been accepted by the student, which speaks to what happens when you can actually build that connection between the students and, and where they work. So we go through practice, and again, it really comes back to feedback, reflection, and doing it over and over again in a safe space. And so the first thing I would tell you is this model of learning is something that if you're not already doing it in your companies, you should be. This whole idea of learn something, practice it, reflect on it, understand what you need to do better, and repeat, not only in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. Because you want to reinforce what people are good at and help them understand how they can really maximize that for impact as much as you want to help them fill in the gaps. So, what are the capabilities of effective engineering leaders? And this is going to be an eye chart, but it is going to be in the deck that's in the conference proceedings, so you will have it, so you don't have to read every single piece of this. But what I want to do is to give you a sense of, as we look at these capabilities, what are the broad buckets? So the first one is just this concept of 
core values, character, and accountability. And so it starts with things like just taking initiative. So how do you, when faced with a problem, always position yourself as, I want to be part of the solution, not just complain about the problem? It, it seems like a simple thing, but it's actually very, very important in terms of what sets a technical person up for success. How many of you in your companies have heard technical people say, well, if only management had dot, dot, dot? I can tell you the number of times I've heard technical people complain about management over the course of my career. If I had a dime for each one, I'd be really, really rich right now. On the other hand, if you start by saying, OK, let me understand what's causing that, and let me see how I can influence it, that leads you to a very, very different place. Second broad bucket is this bucket of relating. So it's a concept of inquiry and dialogue. It's a concept of developing and deploying structured communications. So Scott in the lab, I think structured communications is the one we're doing this Friday. So it's an interesting, so they've gone through earlier this week and they've learned the theory of structured communication. So structured communication is basically what you do on writing. So you don't have the opportunity to go back and forth. So it has to be really clear. And so what they're asked to do is each team has to take an object, and we use things like a fly fishing a reel, a planetary gearbox, uh, a, a clock, and we ask each team to take it apart. And as they're taking it apart, we ask them to write a set of instructions to put it back together again. And what's interesting is most teams start off with the obvious, well, if I just document how I take it apart and just reverse that, then that'll work. And then they realize that if you just have a bag of parts and a set of instructions, you don't even know what you're trying to build. <laughs> but what's super cool is then they get to take their bag of parts and their instructions and give it to another team and get a bag of parts and instructions from a team that had something completely different. And then they have to try and put it back together. And then they give each other feedback. And so what's cool about that is you're not teaching them they're teaching each other. And so that's the concept of like how we bring some of this stuff to life. So the third one is sense making. So, you know, one of the stories I love to tell in the professional education course that I, I do is I was in charge of the GLAD business. We had an amazing technology that we knew could actually get emotional engagement in trash bags. Um, this is what turned out to be Glad Force Flex Plus with Febreze. It did amazing things. But if you are a company in a category like trash bags, where you know that over time the category is going to decline because you're going to have diversion, you're going to have recycling, you're going to have composting, how do you convince a company to spend $100 million on a recapitalization of a plant if they know the category is going to go down? And what you help them to see is, OK, if I can solve someone else's problem and at the same time solve mine, I've got, a, I've got a chance at it. And in the end, what it was was that the innovation actually provided a significant cost savings as well. And to any company in a declining category, cost savings are like money falling from heaven because it's money that's, that's sure, whereas innovation is inherently uncertain. And so taking those two together and understanding how to do that is important. The next is visioning. And so how do you create motivating environments where people are truly inspired to give their best? Um, and one of the things that Ritu talked about earlier was this sort of, how, you know, how do you do inclusion? One of the pieces that I do in our graduate course is really on leading diverse teams. And how do you motivate diverse teams? Not just from diversity, but actually to inclusion to get to real belonging, and how do we use the differences that we have as a way of finding the commonalities that we have that may not be obvious, and how does that build the, the cohesion of a team? Um, you know, things of, just in terms of thinking creatively, defining solutions, and architecting. Then 
The next is delivering on the vision. Um, and this is really about sort of, you know, the things that people think about here are really sort of like planning and managing a project to completion and exercising good project and solution judgment and, and thinking critically. We had an interesting, uh, we had actually an advisory board meeting this morning. Um, and one of the members of our advisory board is Dan Riccio from Apple, who was once the head of all of Apple hardware and is now still a direct report to, to uh, Tim Cook and working on what he can't tell us about because he'd have to kill us, but he says it's going to be the next cool Apple product and like literally doing that. And we were talking about how do these things all come together and his, his thesis, which I think is interesting, is as a young engineer, the ones that you really need to focus on are the ones in the top left. So like really taking initiative and really sort of diving in and solving the problems and the ones on the bottom right, really sort of like managing the project, getting the work done and delivering. And that a lot of the stuff that's in between, like visioning, actually comes in as you move higher and higher up in companies. And so giving them a sense of like, okay, not just having the, the whole toolkit, but how might you use it and when might you use it? So, um, you know, as I think about, you know, just quick, so we, we graduate about 300 students every year from UPOP, 150 odd from GEL1, which is the program for the many, 35 from GEL2. And GEL2 is interesting because what we're doing is we're using the GEL2s who were GEL1s as the coaches for the GEL1s. So by the time they leave, they will have given performance discussions to their GEL1s in a way that most of us didn't have to do until we became first line supervisors sometime you know, years into our career. Um, we do have, for the graduate program in engineering, the graduate certificate in technical leadership. We started off with 11 in 2019, 37 in 2020, and we're growing. Um, and we have two uh, professional education courses, which I'll talk to at, at the very end. But what I want to do is to just give you a real quick example of how I bring this to life in both our graduate course and in the professional education course. And so it's an industry story. And the context is that the brilliance of an idea, the performance of the product, the seamlessness of service might not be enough. And that not all growth is created equal. And a lot of the time, technical people look at constraints and they go, don't put constraints on me, don't I? But my thesis is actually that constraints actually can fuel innovation. So, Bert Spies. Um, so as those of you who might have been involved it, ever in a company that does an acquisition, you know that when you pay almost a billion dollars for another company and you are a publicly traded company, there is a lot of pressure on you to show that the due diligence you did when you looked at that acquisition is actually going to be real. And so delivering on the acquisition value for Clorox when they bought Burt's Bees was absolutely critical. And so the proposal that came was, well, we can just license the brand onto everything. And those of us who are in R&D, and of course, anyone who had been in Burt's Bees in little Durham, North Carolina, looking at these folks in California trying to take over their company went, please don't do that. Because if you do that, you're gonna take what's special about Burt's and you're gonna completely devalue the brand. So the agreement we made was, short term, the better thing to do is not license the name, but put it into broader distribution. At the time that Clorox uh, bought them, they weren't in Targets and Walmarts. Granted, slightly different population, but still much less risk, it's the same product. But long term, we said, we will figure out how to do it with innovation. So when you're innovating, and for those of you who do corporate innovation, these questions are probably not new. They're, they're not rocket science. But it's, where will my consumer give my brand permission to go? That's the first question. Like, just ask consumers, where, where can I go with this brand? The second question you ask is, where are the largest profit pools? So if I'm going to innovate something, I have to be able to make money out of it. So where is the money? The third one is, where do I have a right to play? So as you look at your assets, what am I actually going to do if they say I can go with my brand, there are large profit pools, do I have a right to play? And the most critical one is, can I build a believable way to win? 
So we take people through the class this way. And so for Burt's Bees, when we asked, we said, where will the consumer give us permission to go? And the answer was almost anywhere. <laughs> it was such a strong brand name that they said, you could go almost anywhere. Except wherever you go, you had better not deviate from Burt's natural standard. That is what people believe was core to the brand. So, okay, check one. So where are the natural profit pools? Um, for the women in the audience, maybe some of the men too, premium color cosmetics. The profit margins in premium cosmetics are almost obscene. They're, they're pretty amazing. And okay, if we're gonna go there, where do I have a right to play? Well, we make lip balm. So why don't we start with lips? And then the real question is, can I build a believable way to win? So I just put this here. So th this is Burt's natural standard. This is what we had to adhere to. All products are over 95% natural. We strive for 100%. Non-natural ingredients are only used at low levels for, pres for preservatives. Our sourcing practices focus on supply chain transparency and sustainability. We formulate within, without parabens, phthalates, petrolatum, and SLS, and we don't test our products on animals. And by the way, fast forward a few years, that last one became a real big issue because one of the biggest markets for Burt's was China, and China would not allow cosmetics unless they were tested on animals. And Burt's actually held up, and it took three years to get China to approve an in vitro set of tests, but they finally got that, and it went in. So you think about all of these things and you think about recyclable packaging, the implications are really, their implications on costs, their implications on logistics, because if you don't have synthetic preservatives, um, you have to be careful about temperature, you have to be careful about a whole lot of things, and also for consumer delight. So we started with things like, for instance, um, we did consumer groups and we asked women, how do you evaluate how good a lipstick is. And it was surprising to me, maybe not to some in the audience, that premium lipsticks can go up to $60, $70. People will pay $60 or $70 for a lipstick, and I was like, really? Ouch. But when we started asking the question, okay, so how do you determine how good a lipstick is? And we got the answers that you might expect, which are, I want the color to be good, I want the way it goes onto my lip to be good. And then we noticed something else that when we were giving women different ones to see how they felt about it, they kept doing this. And implicitly, although no one could tell us, what they were doing is they were making a value judgment that the heavier the lipstick was, the better it was. So here's the trick. How do you think prestige lipsticks get the heaviness that's in them? Guesses. That's exactly, it, it's, it's the package, but it's that. There is actually a small metal disc at the bottom of the lipstick in the packaging that's there for no other purpose than to make it heavy. Now, if you're gonna have recycling packaging, you can't do that. So we're like, okay, we'll make it high, as high density plastic as we can, but how do we make up for that? So one of the other things we've realized as people were doing it is women like to just reach into their bag and pull it out. They didn't want to actually have to look. And so that led us to a square case. It led us to high density plastics. It led us to a honeycomb package with the actual color in a sleeve so that you could actually see it because we were straddling that border between a mass market product and a, and a prestige product. We weren't going to be in Macy's where you could actually go and try it and test it. And because we had to use natural color, we were gonna use color burst. So we we're gonna actually have color crystals in there that were freeze dried so that the color would be intense even though we were using natural color. So, okay, and we tested that and it came back and it was like, okay, that's okay. But that didn't give us the right to win. And then it was actually 
a young female engineer asked the question, she's like, what's the core of our brand? And we're like, we're a lip balm company. We're all about moisturizing lips. And the unlock came from realizing that most lipsticks, even prestige lipsticks, use petroleum products as their base. And one of the reasons that women reapply lipstick multiple times a day isn't just because they want to touch up the color. It's because when you put petroleum on your lips, you actually dry your lips. <laughs> and so you're actually putting more on to try and get rid of the drying when what you're doing is actually making it worse. <laughs> and so what we said is, OK, we're going to turn that paradigm on its head completely. And what we did is we used the lip balm base as the formulation for the lipstick. And what that led us to was the ability to get an eight-hour moisturizing claim. And we had the clinical studies as proof of that. So first they're out. Burt's was the number four lipstick in the US. Not the number four natural lipstick. It was just the number four lipstick. So takeaways from the story as, as we do it in the class are constraints can fuel innovation. Use adversity as an opportunity to think differently. Critically look at what you need to do to have a right to play. What can give you a right to win? Inventory your current assets and see how you might use them differently. Use technology or consumer approaches from different categories and communicate your right to win compellingly. So now as I try to pull this together, so how can this help you as you do corporate innovation? So the first thing I would say is hire MIT students. And when you hire them, look for participation in UPOP. Look for the Certificate of Engineering Leadership that comes at the end of GEL 1. Look for the Advanced Certificate of Engineering Leadership that comes at the end of GEL 2. Or look for the Graduate Certificate in Technical Leadership. But as importantly, Benchmark against the capabilities of effective engineering leaders that I put up for you and that you'll have in your own organizations. Look at your own organizational strengths and opportunities. Look at which of your technical staff are stronger and weaker in which of those areas. And do two things. Work on intentionally increasing their capability. But immediately, look at creating teams with complementary capabilities. Because a team of complementary capabilities is actually stronger than any one individual. And then take advantage of our professional education courses. Uh, Design Thinking and Innovation for Cross-Functional Leaders is July 18 to 20th in person here in Cambridge. Engineering Leadership for Emerging Leaders, July 25th to 29th in person here in Cambridge. So with that, we still have a few minutes. Questions. And these questions can be anything on what I said today or from a career in corporate innovation, um, anything that is on you guys' mind, happy to talk about. Nope, not yet. There, yeah. Yeah, you know, I have a, a very interesting question from a company I work with on, um, and I'm hearing a lot more about the multi-generational workforce, mm -hmm. you know, where we look at the, you know, the old people like me as they're the leaders and, you know, the, the hierarchical, that's all gone away. So I would love your comments on leadership in this. You know, what if you're young and you're leading, you know, people twice your age, or, or how, how is that affecting the the whole leadership dynamic within corporations. Yep, so I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll give you two things that I think are affecting it that are moving in opposite directions. So one, um, I think as a leader who is young, you have to understand what's in it for those you are leading, even if they are older. And there are some things that they will know because they have had way more experience than you have had. And so it's always a discussion of, what do you bring to the table, and how do you enable their success? You know, when I was early on in my career, um, one of the people who were reporting to me, one of his first questions for me as his new boss was, how old are you? <laughs> and my answer to him was, help me to understand why that matters to you. And, and, and so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, like, shut him off, but it's sort of like engage in that discussion. But the other, I think, is, for young leaders to understand 
that you haven't done everything and seen everything. And sooner or later, you're going to come up against something that you need a lot of people's help to solve. And so I think they're the same concept. These concepts have been around for forever. We've always had multi-generational teams. I think we have to be much more intentional now about trying to meet people where they are and understand that while we hold the mission of the team as non-negotiable, there may be many different ways to get there. <laughs> I think it's worth noting that in the engineer in the room uh, exercises where people from industry come in and are advising the students uh, uh, after the exercises, that that also gives them some of that context of here's an old engineer, wow, they may have something useful to hear. And so kids in the gel program already are kind of conditioned to do that extra listening for experience and hopefully are taking that into the workplace with them so they're more conditioned to hear that once they do hit industry. Any other questions? Because we are over time here, but... Well, thank you, Reza. That was amazing.